Hallelujah. Thank God for who he is this morning. And can we celebrate him again for our worship and what they continue to do every single Sunday. Amen. And thank God for, while we're giving shout outs unto the Lord, thank God for Brother Smitty on last week, uh, just lending himself, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Before the people, amen. Great word. And I heard somebody say, man, I won't look at football the same. Amen. Wrong jersey, but right word. <laughs> amen. We'll talk about it later. The Panthers, we need prayer. I don't know what's going on. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. We need help. In Jesus' name. I'm excited. Uh, this morning, I really am. I truly believe uh, that the Lord, as always, every Sunday, uh, wants to speak to us. And for us to be grateful for what he does and who he is. And I will tell you this morning that it may seem like on a Sunday that we are going through a Bible study, but I believe it will seem this way because the Lord wants us to come in contact with as much word as we can. And regardless of how good you think your immune system is, if you hang around enough sick people, eventually you'll get sick. And I believe the longer you come in contact and hang around with the Lord, that you will catch whatever the Holy Spirit wants you to catch. Say amen. And uh, two places I want to come from this morning. And if you have your Bibles, please, please walk with us very carefully. And first of all, the gospel, according to Brother Luke, chapter 21, beginning at verse 25. And then we will stay in the New Testament in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Let me say it again, Luke chapter 21, beginning at verse 25, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. And I want to leave you and kind of begin with this. If you don't remember anything that we preach about this morning or minister to, I want you to be very careful, and it's, it's funny how this works with worship and the lyrics to the song and fear and anxiety, um, it, and I never really communicate uh, with the worship team as, as bad as sometimes they want to, to and say, Pastor Cliff, we want the worship songs to kind of line up with what you're speaking on, and I go, well, we can't play that game because I've prepared for messages and word and I drive to church Sunday morning and like kind of like this morning, God switches gears on me. So I would hate for you to sing something that doesn't go with the word, but it's amazing even in that transition, how God is still able to speak through song and, and through his word. And the foundation I really want to leave you with this morning is this warning, and that is simply to be careful to what and who you lend your mind and your hearts to. Because whatever you lend your mind and your hearts to is eventually what will come out of your mouth. And there's a lot of things in the earth, Smitty, that we're talking about. A lot of things that are captivating our attention. Uh, what, what's some of the, the things that I'm, that I'm hearing? Folks are saying, man, have you heard Drake's new album? Have you, have you... Have you, have you seen Rihanna's baby? Have you, have you heard that Vandersloot finally admitted to killing Natalie Holloway? 
And have you have you heard that Messi, the soccer player, he's came to Charlotte and done some great things and have you heard this and have you seen that? And the housewives of LA, New Jersey, I think Lake Norman coming next. <laughs> and Atlanta and all of this and just a bunch of talking. And Jesus is somewhere in the background going, what about me? What about me? I, the one that, that, that saved you delivered you, set you free, filled you with the person of the Holy Spirit. Like I, I, I know a lot of things are going on and you're seeing a lot on news outlets, but what about me? What about talking about me, the one whose promises are yes and amen? Talk about my second coming because the church seemingly is forgetting that I am coming back and that I'm still knocking on the doors of hearts all around the world, waiting for people to turn the doorknob on the other side. I am such a God and a gentleman all wrapped in one that I'm not going to force my way into your heart, but I love you enough that I will knock until you answer the door. And when you let me in, I want to come and have supper with you. When are people going to talk about me? I'm coming. And the dead that are in Jesus Christ will rise first. Talk about that noise that will be loud like a trumpet of an archangel. How about those that are still alive? and remain that will be caught up together to meet me in the air. Talk about me. And I love Jesus' words because we're going to transition from what Jesus says to what the Apostle Paul is going to say. And right in the very beginning, we see Jesus open up his heart and I love this particular passage because it is indicative of the omniscience of who Jesus is. It shows his knowledge. It lets us know that even in his earthly ministry, he's thinking about us in the now, even back then. We serve a good God. I said we serve a good God. And I hear my G, baby. It's going to be a good Sunday. And Jesus says that there will be signs. Say myon in the Greek. There will be uh, unusual occurrences. Things that are going to happen in the sun, in the moon, and even in the stars. And Jesus says that these aren't going to be secrets that the Father and I are going to hoard and keep away from the people. That it's not going to be a secret that I am going to come back again. That I've given creation the technology and the ability and even instruments like telescopes and gyroscopes and all sorts of scopes and tools for you to even look up and see the brightness of stars and constellations even the moon that would turn red like blood that Peter preaches about from the prophecy of Joel in Acts chapter 2 after the day of Pentecost. Jesus says, even if you, listen, if you've got a pair of eyeballs in your head, even if you need uh, contact lenses and Coca-Cola glasses, it is, forgive me, it is absolutely obvious I need prayer. It is absolutely obvious that I am coming and you can see and prove that the second coming is a reality simply through the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
Like it, this, this is not a secret. I'm not, I'm not secret sleuth Jesus. I'm doing this so that the people know that my word is true, that I haven't forgotten about the church, that I'm still the groom waiting and preparation for the wedding ceremony, that I'm coming for the bride of Christ, that I'm here for those that are desperately and patiently waiting and longing for my return. Then he says, on the earth, he's talking about where he used to live, but no longer lives anymore. And he says, on this earth, that will be the distress of nations. Doesn't that sound like today? You think that when you ask the body of Christ to pray for the state of Israel, that it would cause a straight up revival. But I haven't witnessed as much anti-Semitism as I've ever seen like I see today. I'm talking a straight up bias and a prejudice for the Jewish people. And we've ignored this nation and this people as an American church. We figure, man, you know, they, they go to bed and I'm waking up and when I'm waking up, they're going to bed and they're in a different time zone and I'm in a different time zone. And listen, it, it, it bothers me. It, it hurts me a little bit because it proves that we're not reading the word of God and we're not trusting God at his word. Because if we knew anything about Jesus, they had a plan and he had a plan in the beginning. The word even says through the lips of Paul that the Jewish people received the oracles of God. They were the people of promise, meaning that God not only had a plan for them then, but he's got a plan for them now. And even in the future, Jesus has a rescue plan for his chosen and that everything that happens with the state of Israel, even though we are a Gentile people, it affects us directly or indirectly with the direction of us as a body, and it points directly to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we see all the distress of nations and perplexity, the Bible says, with the sea, and the waves that roar and make a lot of noise. And I love verse 26 because Jesus is about to drop the hammer. I like saying that. And somebody said, that ain't Bible. You should read your Bible. In fact, God asked the question in Jeremiah 23 and 29, is not my word like the fire and the hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. And here we're going to see Jesus because what he's going to reveal and unveil in this one scripture is what I believe is the problem with what's going on here in the earth. Jesus says out of his own mouth that the reason that the heart's or failing men and women is from fear. That the reason that there's failure in the hearts of men and women alike are because people are afraid and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers Listen to the word, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And I'm not a pastor that likes to really dive into series unless I feel like the Lord has taken me there, nor do I like to preach on specific words, but the word for this morning is simply dealing with fear. A lot of us, have been seized and we've been taken out the fight because of fear. We are afraid. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, I need you to be sober minded. I need for you to be sober minded. Let me say again. 
I need for your mind to be sober and for you to be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the father of lies, Beelzebub, listen to what he's saying. He is walking about roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Did you hear what I said? Are you listening? Basic English and the process of elimination leads me to believe if there is a people that the devil can devour, then there's got to be a people that he cannot devour. And the people, listen to me, that I believe will be devoured will be those that have been shaken by the roaring. Life has a tendency to roar. And I want to expose the devil because I, I, I have a, I have a, John, I have a fascination with exposing the evil works of darkness. Let me help you understand something. There is only one person in the realm of the spirit that is qualified to take the title of a genuine lion. He comes from the tribe of Judah. Let me tell you something. He is from the seed of David. He is the one who was crucified crucified, who was hung high and stretched wide. I feel God's presence this morning. He is the one that was put inside of a grave, Tabitha. And in three days, when they went back to check the grave, there was nothing left but clothes. And he got out of the grave with all power in his hands. Stop letting the devil fool you because the word says, listen to me. He is not even a lion. He is a liar, but he is not a lion. He's not. But he's making a bunch of noise and he's roaring and is causing you to be shaken with fear. Don't you understand the, the tactics of the devil? The enemy moves by fear like God moves by faith. And understanding here that the coming on the earth and the powers of heaven, that Jesus is shaking the heavens. And if Jesus is shaking the heavens, that means that the church will also be shaken. Have you ever seen uh, EMT and, and EMS officials or anybody who, uh, who, who's shaking somebody who may be like a choking victim or, or may be unconscious? The first thing that they'll do while checking their pulse to make sure that they're alive, I'm Maria, is they shake them a little bit to make sure that they're conscious. And what I see, yes, God, I hear you, in the realm of the spirit is Jesus is shaking the church and a lot of us can't wake up because we're asleep behind the wheel. Jesus is shaking us to wake us up to the reality of his second coming. And unfortunately, I see that there are many of us that are unconscious and God is trying to bring a God consciousness back to the unconscious because the heavens are being shaken. And this roar... I'm, a, I'm an animal guy. I like watching Nat Geo and Planet Earth. And it's something I saw an episode one time and I like cameras and they have all these expensive cameras and they sit out in the wild and they were in the jungles of South America and they saw a, a lion and, and, and a bunch of little cackling hyenas and they, you know how they sound and making a bunch of noise. I don't know. I have the gift to make a bunch of noises. I can do cows and chickens and turkeys and ducks. I can do all of that stuff. I don't know what it is. And, and, and what's amazing is they catch all of these different angles. And before it hits Netflix and Amazon Prime uh, videos and Redbox, if that's still a thing now, and uh, before it does that, they get all of these different sequences and they, in post-production, they put them together to create what's called a clip. And, and the female lionesses are kind of doing their thing, watching over the kids. 
And Daddy Lion, he kind of stands up and he does one of those stretches in his mouth. Oh, my goodness. If I had a tape measure, that thing was huge. And, and the hyenas, they, they're looking at the lion, the lion's den from afar. And I think that the lion sensed the presence of the hyenas. And as soon as the lion opened his mouth and began to roar, the hyenas, they stopped cackling, and you should see the clip. And if I find it, maybe I'll figure out a way to put it on the church's page or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But the hyenas, they stop in their tracks, and they don't move. Just the sound of the roar caused the hyenas to stop. And what you don't understand, hear me, I'm talking the word this morning. What a lot of us don't understand is that's what the enemy does. He will roar just loud enough to a point where it will cause you to be, I mean, perplexed. Uh, it will neutralize you because you've been shaken by fear. Do you know, have you ever been so afraid before that it, when you, somebody scares you or catches you off guard that you have so much fear inside of you that you can't even speak? That's what fear does. That's what the enemy wants. Do you remember what happened on 9-11? Do you remember September 11, 2001? And I know vividly for me, I know exactly where I was and what I was doing and who I was doing it with. And, and, and I was already coming out of basic training in a movie theater, uh, getting a brief in Fort Carson, Colorado. And, and during that time, I remember there were three planes. There was one that went into the Pentagon, one that crashed into the World Trade Center, and one, I think, uh, was abandoned and went somewhere in Somerset, Pennsylvania, or somewhere around there. And, and if you remember, the jihadists and the terrorists that were in these planes there was no ransom. They weren't, they weren't doing it for the money. They, they, they didn't want a purse. They didn't, they didn't want, uh, uh, the, the, the fame. Uh, they weren't looking to be on social media. But what real terrorists do is that they terrorize and they wanted to instill fear in the American people. It's the same thing that the devil does now. And a lot of us still have phobias and fears from 9-11, from, from COVID year in 2020. A lot of us are even afraid with what's going on with Hamas and the state of Israel uh, because of what we see that the enemy is doing through school shootings. We're taking our children out of public school and for various other reasons. We won't go to movie theaters anymore because we've seen the shootings all over uh, in the movie theater and all the devil wants to do is instill fear. The more I can terrorize you and neutralize you with fear, you will never pay attention to what the voice and the spirit of God is wanting to not only speak to you, but to the church. And Jesus said that will be the son of man, verse 27, that will come in the cloud with power and with great glory. That the Son of Man is coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now these things begin to happen. And Jesus says, if you look up, your head can't be hung down. And fear will cause your head to hang down. And Jesus says, if you're in this posture, it's hard to see what I want you to see. But fear will cripple you. It will put you in a place where you won't even look for the things of God, but you are so afraid that now all of the glory and now all of the attention, even when you go to your secret place of prayer and close the door in the closet behind you to pray to your father who sees you in secret, every supplication, every petition unto the Lord is no longer glorifying the Lord anymore, but all you can do is talk about the devil and how much fear that he's put inside of your heart. And Jesus says, I want you to look up. And lift up your heads. Why should you lift up your heads? Why should we be looking up as a people? Because your, 
Jesus made it absolutely personal. He said, your, mine and your redemption draws near. Listen to me, church. We are on the precipice of, I'm talking about a universal revival. But before we can ever, ever have a corporate mode of a universal revival, revival starts first in your heart. Revival starts first in your heart. And when the hearts of God's people are revived, it will bleed into the church and from the church into the streets and into the streets, into the world. And watch how many people will come out of the darkness that worship sang about this morning and walk and experience the marvelous light. Look up. Lift up your heads. Because your redemption, your redemption draws near. Paul and Timothy have a, a very unique relationship, and I pray that we have more Paul and Timothy relationships in the body of Christ. It's one that when I first got saved and read about and I was exposed to, that I was even somewhat jealous of. And the Lord said, I gave you a Paul, and he is a spiritual father and a mentor to me even to this day from when I was saved in 2009. And I challenge you because this is, a, this is really, I believe, a missing ingredient. And I told you this morning what feel like a Bible study. But this, this is really a, a key ingredient, I think, for the church to be able to thrive in the times that we're living in. Paul even teaches us in the words written in Titus that the younger women are to cling to the older women. And that the younger men should cling and cleave to the older man, but there's a few problems that this isn't happening. One, you've got the older that say, I ain't got time for the younger. I'm old enough to be their daddy and even their granddaddy and grandma and, and mama. They can't teach me anything. And then the younger go, they're too religious and stiff. They're too boring and lame anyway. They L7s, they squares. Well, let them, let them, yeah. Right, so that ne there's never that thing that happens. All right, you good, Michelle. They ain't talking about you, right? We, we, we see that. And then the other side is you've got the older women trying to be like the younger women and the older men trying to keep up with the young men. And then you have the younger men that want to confide in the older women. And I believe what we see in that, and I wish I really had time to go deeper, but typically that there are younger men who have what I call daddy issues that have struggled with having a natural uh, observance and a relationship with their fathers that even when they get saved and filled have a tendency to cling and go to a woman for motherly spiritual, spiritual advice. But there's a purpose behind why God has set it up the way that he set it up. And I'm not saying that there's a problem for younger men reaching out to an older woman, but again, there's a purpose and a divine purpose for why God has called such relationships like these. And Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, he called him. Look at the words right here. If you, if you like taking notes, I know you say, man, this is, this is just a basic verse. Now, it's powerful. He called him a beloved son, but he, then he says, listen, grace, mercy, and peace, which is the total opposite of what the world preaches. The world says money, power, respect. <laughs> get the money, get the power, and get the respect. And Paul says, nah, it's grace that can only come from Jesus. Mercy that it can only come from Jesus. And peace that can only come from the God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And I thank God whom I serve. Listen to this. This is a challenge to you this morning. And I always pray that the Lord would challenge us and take us to a place that we haven't gone before. He says, I, I, Paul says, I can serve the Lord with a pure conscience. My prayer this morning is that while you're serving the Lord, is that you serve him with a pure conscience. Because the reality is, is that a lot of us are serving and we're in a place of servitude, but our consciences are not pure. Mm, my God. As my forefathers did is without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers and the worship can come forward. 
I remember you in my prayers, Paul says, night and day. I don't stop praying about you. I don't stop thinking about you. You're always on my mind because there's a great gift that the Lord has put in you, Timothy. You're going to do some great things and my life is coming to an end and I'm going to meet the Lord and I'm excited about it. I think I, I'm prepped for it. I, I ran my race well. I, I, I think I'm, I know I'm finished strong. I became the will of God. I've done all that he's asked me to do. I'm in a place now where fear one time may have, have seized and paralyzed me and shut my mouth and did all these horrific things, but there's something special in you and you're like a spiritual son to me. He says, I'm mindful even of your tears. Paul says that I may be filled with joy. And he says, when I think about you, Timothy, he's giving him all sorts of encouragement. He says, when I, when I think about you, I call to remembrance the amount of genuine faith that is inside of you. That you're the most faithful person that I think I've ever come in contact in the ministry. And then he says, in your genuine faith that's in you, it started with your grandmama and your mama, Lois and Eunice. If you know anything about the life of Timothy, he, he was bred and raised in a very unique situation. His, his natural father was Greek and his mother and grandmother were Jew, which in this day chronologically, I've got to believe and assume spiritually that this caused a little, you know, dissension within the home. And I think about what Paul says in remembering Timothy and that he was raised in the scriptures by his mama and his grandmama. And even though my grandmothers on my mama and my daddy's side are no longer here to be with me, I can remember my grandmama praying for me. I can remember my grandmother on both sides and even my mama, I would make fun of them. And my mama would say, boy, I know you out there up to no good. But even when you ain't thinking about the Lord, I'm praying for you. And I believe it is the prayers of my mama who will watch this message and my grandmother who will see me one day in glory that I will be able to thank her for the prayers because I believe it was the prayers of these two women, all three women, in matter of fact, that led me to salvation in Jesus Christ. And Paul says... Lewis and Eunice, I am persuaded in you also that therefore I remind you to stir up the gift, stir it up, which is in you through the laying of my hands. Paul said, Jesus led me to lay hands on you and it was through the laying of my hands that God's gift was placed inside of you. He says, I want to remind you. And Paul tells all these great things to his son, Timothy, only to leave him at this point. Timothy, you're great, only in God. You've done some amazing things. You're going to take over the ministry. I believe you're going to open doors and preach words and teach the word in such a way that folks are going to be forced to come out of darkness and experience the greatness of the great I am, Jesus Christ. But there's one thing I need you to be careful for. And Paul says in verse 7, like what I believe Jesus, even from what we, where we started in Luke 21, is saying to the church abroad. And he says here in verse 7, I reminded you of a lot, but let me help you understand that God Almighty has not given you fear. No, 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 no. That God has not given us a spirit of fear. Underline that. And a lot of us cannot overcome fear because we're trying to fight fear with the natural knowledge and wherewithal within ourselves. Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, he talked about it in his 1933 inaugural speech 
the famous uh, statement that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. I don't know if FDR was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, but my God, is there so much truth in that. Paul tells Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear and the, listen to me, the only way you can fight the spirit of fear is in the realm of the spirit. Are you listening? And I know some of the most faithful people are hit with fear. But you can't fight fear. You, let me tell you, you can have an RPG. You can have Chinese rockets. You can have implemented explosive devices. You can be strapped with bombs. You can get all types of guns and fragmentary grenades. It cannot kill fear. The only way you cast out fear is getting on your knees and looking to the Lord God in heaven and calling out that fear that has crippled you and paralyzed you year after year after year. Some of you know you've heard God tell you to do a thing and fear has crippled you, has neutralized you and caused you not to move. You would have that Bible study two and three years right now in your neighborhood and even in your home if you were not crippled by fear. You would be doing what God has called you to do in the ministry if you had not been neutralized by the spirit of fear. You'd be that person that God has elevated you, raised you, set, uh, I expanded territory for you to be if it was not because of fear. You are afraid of failing. You are afraid of what everybody's going to think about you. You are afraid of what people are going to say about you. But why are you not worried and fearful of what God is thinking about you? Fear is a spirit. And to cast away the spirit of fear takes the power of the Holy Spirit. Stop treating fear like it's a natural thing when the word of God exegetically and authentically calls it out as a spirit. The only way you fight this spirit is with the glory of spirits and the father of spirits who is Jesus Christ. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Start that business God has told you to start. Start that ministry God has told you to start. Open that door that God has, there's been a crack in it. You ain't got to turn the doorknob. All you got to do is walk. It's there. Stop being afraid. You can't stop the devil from roaring, but you can change your response to the roar. Let him roar. Let him make all the noise he wants to make. Because I know the king of glory and that spirit of fear he has not given to you, Timothy, Emmanuel Church, and the world. But he's given you power, he's given you love, and he's given you a soundness of mind. Don't you ever forget that. And I know that you're a sheep, and I look at the scriptures tabs, and I'm like, couldn't God make me a better animal? Like a sheep, for real? Like, they, I mean, they weak, they, they, they have trouble even chewing their own food. I, I read up on them. They're silly. They something, a little butterfly will catch their attention and they'll go chase after the butterfly and try to catch it. Like they got wings and go fly and catch the butterfly. Like, like I couldn't give me, like Jesus, you couldn't say that like I was a, something with claws or something that could roar. I mean, I would have rather been a hyena than a sheep, Lord. What he said, he made me a sheep. And I'm like, man. And I think about Psalm 23 and I'm done. Psalm 23, especially in the southeast, has been that thing where 
We've, we've been reciting it. If you've born in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, you've been reciting it since you were here. And you recite it on Easter, and resurrection celebration. You recite it on Christmas. You, you call it to your remembrance. But I feel like that this is the hour in the morning where the Lord is saying, Psalm 23 has to go beyond something that you recite, and it has to be something that you live. And there's no better person to describe the relationship between sheep and shepherd outside of Jesus than King David himself. He was called to be king when he was tending to the shepherd. When Jesse was getting all the other boys, Je uh, David was doing his thing with the sheep and even his daddy from the rod of Jesse felt like his own son wasn't qualified. And it says that the Lord is my shepherd. Not one time in Psalm 23, while David is surrounded by fear and his enemies, does he ever talk about the devil? We've got to stop going to God talking about the roar of the devil and give the glory to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. God, I wish I had time. Mike Chapman. He makes me to lie down. Lying down spiritually and even naturally is a position of comfort. It's the same word used when they were on the ship with Jesus and the roaring of the waves was going crazy. The word says that Jesus was at the bottom of the boat snoring and slobbering. He was asleep even in the midst of the storm. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me. Only he can lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David, even though he knew he had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death that belongs to the devil, he doesn't mention the devil's name one time. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, these five words, I will fear no evil. I will Fear no evil. Say it with me with power. I will fear no evil. Walk out of this church this morning with those five words stamped like uh, what's the like what's the thing they do with cows? Uh, branding. Let, yes, God. Let the branding of God take these five words and brand them and sear them into the flesh of your heart. Stop being shaken by the roar. He is not a lion. He is not a lion. He is a liar. I will fear no evil. And if we can hang on to this reality, is there really a limit into who we can become in God and where we can go in the name of Jesus Christ? And the answer, like my sister in the back, is a good old east and west no. There's no boundaries on where God can take you and what he wants to do with you. But you got to get out of fear. I pray this morning, as I ask you to stand, is that we can cast fear and the cares of this world aside. Because this world will pass away, the Bible says. And the only thing that will ever stand the test of time is the righteous words of Almighty God. Stop being afraid. But Pastor Cliff, I don't know what they're going to think about me. Who cares? Let me testify real quick, 15 seconds. One of the greatest victories in my life wasn't that I was called to preach and teach God's word or to start a church or to play an instrument or play drums. It was No, it wasn't. One of the greatest victories in my life as a young man is that the Spirit of God delivered me from the opinions of people to include my own family. That because I knew the anointing that was on my life, I had to be in a place in a position that, that even the people closest to me couldn't walk.
I had to, I had to get their opinions and what they thought of me behind me because even your family sometimes will become a stumbling block and create fear within you to cause you to go where God wants you to go. That's why when Jesus went back to Galilee, it said that he couldn't do many miracles because when he went back, they lacked faith and they thought that he was only the son of a carpenter when he was the lion of Judah. And some people, when you go back to your families, think that you're only a this kid who did that, who was on drugs and hung out in the streets and get beyond that. Get beyond that. One, my greatest victories was when I was delivered from the opinions of people to include my family. I'm called weird by my wife. I'm called weird by my children. I'm called weird by the church. Even my eight-year-old granddaughter says, Papa, you weird, and I'm okay for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, you've got to understand that once you get beyond fear, once you get away and know who God is in relation to evil that there is no limit to what God is able to do. I love this church and I love my family but nothing is going to come between the love of me and Jesus Christ. I won't fear evil. There was a time and a day, believe it or not, that fear would seize me and keep me bound. So what? Your loud mouth? Yeah, my loud mouth. I will fear no evil, but thou art with me. The rod and the staff provide me comfort. They provide me comfort. So as I pray this morning, and I want you to pray with me, my prayer is that through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, that you'll cast out fear that you'll tell it like the devil, get behind you because God is trying to take you somewhere. That we're only pilgrims on this earth for a season, sojourners, but one day these bodies will return back from the dirt from where they came and our souls will go on to live again. So please, I beg of you, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Continue to pray for the state of Israel for these are God's people that are connected to the promises of the great I am. Father.